regular briefing session of the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners. Today is uh, a good day. We have just completed a full agenda where we voted and decisions were made. What we're about to do is uh, brief ourselves, get a briefing from the county manager and other staff on the next meeting that we can have the opportunity to vote on. And having said all of that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Don Martin, who is the Vice Chairman of the Forsyth County Commissioners, to continue this briefing session. Thank you, Chairman Plyler. Um, we are getting ready to have our first briefing for the meeting of August the 4th. And if people are counting weeks, the reason we're missing next week is that the National Association of County Commissioners is having their annual meeting, and most of our group will be there. And we will not be meeting in this room next week, but we will be back um, for uh, actually a briefing, the actual second briefing on July 28th. And then we're, our actual meeting that we're starting the briefing will actually be on August the 4th. Um, we had our first bi-monthly sort of discussion, sort of report session this morning. So as a result, we have no discussion items today. So I'm happy to turn the quick briefing review over to our county manager. All right. uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So as is our practice, the, the public hearings, we will go ahead and brief uh, as we, you know, more in detail formally. And so we've got two of those, and then I'll just quickly run through uh, what the other items we're working on. And those items are not live on our uh, website as of yet, but we'll get those on there as we as we get them <laughs> developed out. Um, so the first one is a public hearing on a zoning petition of R.S. Parker Development, LLC. And it is zoning docket F1617. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Kirk Erickson. And he will review this. Obviously, this is one that you've seen quite. You've seen, we made it almost to the finish line and then we, we pushed it off. So we're re redoing that one. So uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, as the county manager mentioned, can I get this here? Excuse me, I'm sorry. That was the quickest report I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. As uh, the county manager mentioned, you all have been briefed on this a couple of times previously. So with that in mind, I'll ask, do you want me to run through this again in full detail, or would you rather have me hit the highlights? Probably highlights would okay. suit everybody good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, with that in mind, uh, this is F1617 Riverwalk subdivision. Uh, along the Adkin River next to uh, Tanglewood Park near the, the Clemens community. Site's approximately 318 acres, and this request would be a rezoning from the Yadkin River Agriculture and RS-30 single family districts to the Yadkin River Special Use, RS-15S, and RM-5S residential districts. Uh, just briefly, you can see the site again in the southwest corner of the county on the location map. This is a little more detailed uh, image of the uh, boundary lines and Tanglewood Park is the property with IP designated on the uh, north of the map and the site is located on Idles Road at the intersection of Doc Davis Road. Again, an aerial showing the property is largely farmland currently and uh, undeveloped stands of vegetation. Just a few pictures of the subject property Fox Park Drive uh, is one of the streets that the property would be adjacent to and the property would have a proposed entrance, secondary entrance on Fox Park Drive. Property is to the north of the, of the uh, Fox Park Drive sign. This is a picture of the property where it abuts the Tanglewood Golf Course, uh, which is to the north and the east of the property. And uh, just briefly, the site plan has townhome development uh, 138 units along idles and uh, across from the county's industrial park and there's also the idles road lift station on that side of the road and the bulk of this development would be single family homes 399 units uh, generally in this area and this area where my cursor is and then a large portion of the development along the adkin river would remain undeveloped uh, as again there is a major flood plain that the county has uh, indicated preservation status of by designating that Yadkin River. 
district. These were just some zoomed in images of various uh, parts of the site plan that we've talked to you all about in detail at the last couple of briefings. Probably the most notable thing to bring you up to speed on today is during the June briefings on this item, commissioners expressed concerns about the relationship between this development and Tanglewood, specifically concerns about visibility of these units from folks on the golf course, potential liability issues of errant golf balls hitting the, uh, the property and what might happen there. So this item was continued to the August 4th public hearing so the petitioner could better address these concerns. And in the last few weeks, uh, discussions have ensued with the county management and park staff and the developer. And uh, currently the developer is considering options on revising their site plan to include a larger buffer and a wall between the Tanglewood Golf Course and the development lots. So uh, we do have Luke Dickey from Stimmel Associates and Greg Garrett, the representative of the developer here. They're available for any questions if uh, that arises after my presentation, but they're still working on their revised site plan and illustrative graphics, and those should be ready for you at your next briefing. Just also to refresh your memory, there are several transportation conditions uh, that would be approved as part of this request. Again, that was one of the issues that you all kind of had discussions about previously, and there would be improvements to Middlebrook Drive, uh, off-site of the development, basically adding another turn lane and widening the road uh, at the intersection with idles to help accommodate some of the extra trips this project would generate. There would also be widening the southbound approach of idles road at the development to provide a slip lane for folks turning into the development and also widening the southbound approach of Idles Road at Fox Park Drive, that secondary access point that I showed in one of the pictures. So uh, kudos to the developer for providing these improvements and uh, trying to address some of the traffic that they're going to be generated because that is one of the concerns that we heard at the planning board public hearing. Uh, with that in mind, with access to public sewer, which this project has, the legacy plan recommends that this area be treated as a suburban density neighborhood, which would allow development of zero to eight units per acre. This request would also uh, increase the variety of housing types in the area, which is a stated goal of the comprehensive plan. And as mentioned, a large percentage of the site would be left undisturbed. The planning board heard this on May 12th. Uh, there were numerous speakers. Again, as I mentioned, opposition was largely centered around traffic concerns with a few other ancillary concerns thrown in. And the majority of the board did recommend approval of this to the commissioners. The site plan does meet ordinance requirements and I'm glad to answer any questions. And again, the development representatives are also here. That's good, thank you. Questions. One question, Mr. Vice Chair. Were there any concerns raised by the citizens that the developers did not respond to? Uh, to my knowledge, everything has been addressed. Again, the developers were concerned about cut through traffic, which that's not really going to be a huge concern of this development because Fox Park would be the only road that folks could cut through. But due to the circuitous kind of curvilinear nature of Fox Park, it would probably be better for folks just to go through Riverwalk Main Street to exit because that would put them closer to Middlebrook or the Idles Road connector, which is the direction that most traffic would be going. Uh, stormwater, again, they've done a large amount to address that. There's a lot of carrying capacity in the floodplain of the Adkin River. So uh, we've talked about traffic. We've talked about uh, compatibility with adjoining development. Overall, this site is only 1.7 units per acre, which is equivalent to RS20 zoning, which is kind of Clemens standard zoning district. So staff believes that this has done a good job of addressing all the concerns. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna add that um, in the concerns we raised um, from parks, there were two concerns. One was the, you know, the, the, the golf, the, really looking forward how those houses, once they are constructed, could be impacted by the golf course. Are you gonna have golf balls come over and, and that kind of stuff? Um, the other concern was lights from Festival of Lights. Um, you know, folks who buy those homes, particularly uh, on the, the road that um, 
you know, that, that cuts into idols, you know, from the back of the park, you know, for three, two or three months out of the year, they're, they're, that place is lit up with festival lights. And while some, some people may think that's a, a good thing and, and they would like to live near that, um, some may not. And so th that was our other concern that was conveyed to the developer. And so we'll see what the, what the concerns or what well, the I think Mr. Garrett could address that today if it's okay for him to do so. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Greg Garrett. My um, address is 6420 Hampton Knoll Road. That's in Clemens 27012. Um, incidentally, I'm about a mile and a half from this property. So when any of the traffic comments come up, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. You know, it's not like I'm a developer that's way off in another state or in another city or even in another part of the county. I'm, I'm, I'm there, okay? So I think that's important to know. Um, yes, we've had some very productive conversations. Um, of course, this one's been kicking around for a while. And um, I believe we are very close to having a revised site plan that will meet most of those concerns. Of course, early on in my process for um, doing the due diligence on this potential development, I spent um, time with uh, with Mr. Watts and um, his director for public um, for um, the Parks and Recs, and um, we did spend significant time talking about the tr uh, the, the the light festival and. Um, that's one of the reasons for the townhouses being located where they are, um, because that is um, a little um, people that move into townhomes, you know, they're they're OK with sharing a wall with others. And, and so it is usually more open minded to something like that. Of course, we have um, backed it up already and had planned for extensive landscaping. Plus, there will be uh, extensive disclosures about the, the you know, the, the, the Festival of Lights with the time frame that that takes place. And we want to set the expectations right. You guys don't want those phone calls. I don't want those phone calls. <laughs> the builder doesn't want those phone calls. So we think that it's very important to, to, to just be abundantly clear and not just a throw in a, a document, you know, where they're just signing and not reading. This is a separate document that, you know, they will look and have an eyeball to eyeball, <laughs> you know, this is what's happening here. You've signed this disclosure. So that that's the link that we're going to take on on that. And then of course the um, the, um, the the buffering and the kind of I don't, barricade's not the right word, but you know, just kind of making it clear where the, the boundaries are. We want to spend um, extra time making sure that what we would put up, it would be very, very uh, desirable for our future residents. And so the language that had been thrown about around was more like a security fence, maybe similar to what um, is buffering with uh, Cl the Quim Clemens West development. We, we want to go, um, beyond that and do something much nicer. So um, we're, we're pricing out um, a brick wall. And um, now maybe that wouldn't be the entire buffering. There's some places where there's already a lot of vegetation in between, but wherever the residents are really close to the golf course, that is absolutely what we want to do. Something that's very, very aesthetically pleasing that will be a, a, you know, um, good for our our customers to look at, but also good for your customers that are out there on the golf course. And it will be a drastic improvement from what's there now, as you saw the the slide. I mean, <laughs> uh, that that fence is hardly standing up, and it's just it's just not very sightly. So we we, we do plan to be back to you with um, the exhibits that I think you'll be excited about. I think that's great. You know, ever since that was organized, we've had some kind of comment, not necessarily a complaints, and and many of those, to be honest with you, were manufactured for a purpose. You know, I want this. So the only way to get my my story heard is to do this, this, and this. And it's a, some of it's planned, but right. the bottom line is what you're talking about is a good faith effort to really meet the complaint department head on. And frankly, I think it's kind of a great idea. And you know, the Festival of Lights, where Forsyth County is concerned, I think, as I recall, 
there is something similar to that down in Georgia. And uh, they, the board at that time went down to Georgia and looked at it, and they didn't have any complaints at that time at all. But then that's a different place, different land, different hills and that type of thing. But <laughs> Festival of Lights is part of the Christmas Christmas season. So yes, I think, yes. I think you're doing the best. That's that's really good. Yeah, really and good. it's all tastefully done. I mean, this. I mean, the the festival lights is well done, and I, you know, you drive around town at nighttime now, and you see those kind of lights everywhere. I mean, everyone likes right. having <laughs> lights now. So, yeah. but we want to do our part because we we don't want those phone calls, and I know you don't want those phone calls. <laughs> bah humbugger. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you. Any any questions for me? Well, I, I, just a comment. I, I'd had a, a little heartburn about the, not the traffic at the at the Middle Brook um, um, Isles Roads intersection because that's been addressed, and I think that will handle that. But I do think most of that traffic at the time in the early five or six years is going to turn left and get on Middle Brook, and the real intersection I think it's a problem is at 158. Um, I think that's where the backup is already backs up there now, um, and those things. And, and I, in fact, I read the comments in the in the uh, planning hearing. There are people that I drive my kids to school, getting stuck. It takes me, you know, four light changes a term. But I did that just today. What was good news? I, I, Pat Ivy was here this morning, give us an update on some other transportation issues. We took a break. I had a chance to talk to him some. His comments. I talked to him about that that particular intersection, and he brought up the issue about the, basically the work that's being done from, I guess, Peace Haven, four laning, they're doing a, a median through that Louisville Clemens Road, and it's gonna end at that intersection with, uh, um, with 158 in Middlebrook. And he actually said the one thing that, that has to be in the, their consultant that does their work, they need to add in this anticipated traffic into that so that they design that intersection and adjust it properly. He seemed to think that that would happen and it would probably end up with a four lane, four lane, but, but only at Middlebrook on just a little piece as it flares up close to the red light. And that sounded to me like it would probably work and, and, and hopefully the timing, and, and since it's phased the way it's currently phased, it looks like that is likely to work. Um, so yeah, I felt like that was that, that was that was good news because I actually drove out there looking, and I, and I was just in the in an afternoon to I think it was two o'clock in the afternoon. There was a there was a backup at at one fifty eight in Middlebrook. You know, no traffic anywhere else, but that's where there's traffic. Yeah. So that, I felt a, better about there being on top of that, and I think it's kind of maybe we need to make sure as a, as a county that they that that data is in their hands and. Uh, they are obviously familiar with the the, the, the Idles Road intersection, and that, that's a big part of it. He said he he was aware of it, and so he said we need to make sure that's in the right place. Yeah. I can add now that I realize this intersection you're talking about. It's actually planned for a roundabout, two lane roundabout. That would relieve all that that left turn. That would similar to what we have down here. Two lanes all the way around. Yeah, it takes a big radius to do one of the, one that's going to be big enough for four lanes. But yeah, maybe that. I mean, that works. It just seemed to be on their radar, and 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 uh, I mean, you know, Pat Ivy's. I think. I mean, I think he's got it. So I I felt a lot better. That was that had been my concern, is what the. I mean, you could have a lot. Of, there'll be a lot of cars all during the day right. that'll be turning left and going there. That's right. Yeah. So our what I can tell you with with certainty is that our TIA that we um, did for this development was sent to NCDOT Division Nine. They've reviewed it. There was dialogue back and forth with our consultant, and so they they are one hundred percent in the loop. And, well, uh, yeah, and I, well, yeah. they they were in the loop on the on the Middlebrook in, uh, uh, yeah. Isles Road. Yeah. And that was that was well analyzed. In fact, I saw their report. It's still a substandard intersection change. They rate them, but it did get a little better with the turn lane. Then it drops back down. But it, it is, it's it's going to be crowded. But I think the big issue was one that was not included, which is the 158 in Middlebrook, because that's a mile and a quarter down Middlebrook. I just checked right. that, and right. that's kind of down there. But that's where I think the queuing and backup will occur, and multiple red lights there. I think people will get to there without any trouble. 
Yeah, when people are complaining about traffic, it is that intersection that yes. you speak of. Yes, and I don't think that was in your study. That intersection, not specifically. Yeah, I don't think so. But um, I'm, yeah, I'm willing to do whatever you, the, the, the commissioners, please to, to provide more data if need be. Yeah, well, I, I think I think DOT's got that data now. Okay. They've got part a big piece of it. They, they just have a different, you know, they have a lot of different people, a lot of different consultants. It's all about communication. Sure. So we'll always try yeah. to work on that too. But Mr. Thank Vice you. Chairman, question. Maybe, maybe more. Whoever wants to answer the question, uh, the vegetation that is along the uh, Tanglewood property line and the this property in uh, question. What, what is there? Is it, I've never been to the exact location. Uh, is it uh, some tall trees or, but because that's, a, uh, I don't know why I haven't thought of, well, I thought of it before today, but to me, somebody else had mentioned it about the uh, lighting. That just well to be addressed somehow. I don't know exactly how that somehow is Mike, as far as the lights uh, shining, what kind of height would it take? In a, and I wouldn't want you to do a brick wall for that, but some some kind of trees or something. How 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 uh, does a light shine that out? I can admit I can remember when we've had. I can't remember how long it's been. Uh, People complain, and that has been taken the, into account over uh, the years with the development about uh, commercial development and residential uh, lighting. Every, people became more aware of uh, that because we've uh, been some years ago had complained about that. But nevertheless, what what kind of height would it take to? Uh, block some of that light views probably some of the if they this is developed probably some people gonna like lights and probably some people that won't but what kind of height would it take to shield light um yeah the answer your question you know the area that's going to be impacted the most by the light show is that back exit road that borders up to where he has townhouses planned um we have several displays through there uh, we have, have several tunnels uh, one of the tunnels that's a, it's a highly interactive type tunnel, which is changing strobe and different types of patterns during the whole, whole time. It's 24 feet high, um, and it has pretty wide lights sp spread spill out. So it will, you know, impact an area well that well outside of our property. Um, and you know, so you would have to be able to have something high enough to, to cover at least 24 feet. And then you, just, you have to understand the lights are moving and strobing, so there'll still be some spill through whatever you would put. Um, so, you know, as, as we met and talked about that, you know, I feel pretty definitely uh, those townhomes are gonna be impacted by the light show. There's, well, is, there's, is there existing uh, tree vegetation? There's no there? vegetation along that road. Um, well, there is vegetation along the golf course in different places. Some places there's not vegetation, some places it's heavily wooded uh, along the golf course part of the property. Uh, along a couple of our holes, there, the one hole in particular, there's not any vegetation. It's really buffering between that field and where the houses would be at all. And then one of the other holes, there's more vegetation. So it's real mixed down through there. And it's a lot of it's old vegetation, a mix of oaks and, and a lot of different types of things down through that um, uh, through that area. But um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Well, uh, I just know in the the traffic has been talked about uh, of concern and but the uh, this lighting for sure probably would for the people that would live in the area so uh, planting of some trees you could plant planting of some kind of trees that grows fairly uh, fast is something that it, in my opinion, it would probably be uh, need to be seriously considered, and that uh, would be of some cost. But it wouldn't be like the walls that they got along the highways. Yeah, and as far as the traffic, we during the light show we spill up between fifteen thousand, fifteen hundred and two thousand cars a night back on Dials Road. Also, 
So there's um, there's a, that merging of traffic that will occur in that area too. So if somebody needs to, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks about it. Be coming up with some answers on that. Commissioner Lindell, years ago, I don't know how many years it was, uh, Falcon Materials airplane, you went up to West Virginia, Wheeling, West Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I was holding on to the seats so tight. I don't, can't remember <laughs> all of it, but I remember going. Well, when you're talking about the, the type of lighting and type of um, approach that you're using, did you do you recall seeing that kind of thing in Wheeling when you went up there and took a look at it? No, that's, you know how long it's been ago? <laughs> at least 10 years. Long time. So, no, I can't, uh, I can't remember. I was just too, not that, because I was, I, I believe the pilot was telling us he was going to have to fly around the mountain and then fly down in between to get to, <laughs> yeah. with West Virginia. So I had all that stuff on my mind. But no, I, I don't remember that, but I do know that uh, uh, trees can, uh, yeah. Shield a lot of you, and uh, oh, I agree. This it just it'd be one of the things, in my opinion, would need to uh, uh, be seriously considered because everybody that will live in the area in a, in a new proposed development, all of them wouldn't like those lights, but some of them might. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Commissioner Linville, if I could, uh, I've pulled up the zoomed in site plan for this portion of the development. Where my cursor is, is where the internal uh, road inside Tanglewood Park is uh, that Mr. Anderson was talking about. And you can see the tree stamp on the site plan. That's actually a required evergreen buffer yard that is an ordinance requirement. And I think that would represent those fast growing trees that you're talking about, things like Leland Cypress or Arbor Vita or things of that nature that would, you know, have that columnar growth uh, at a pretty rapid rate. Now, again, as, uh, as Mr. Anderson said, it's not going to screen everything because there's going to be strobing and things of that effect. But I think that there's some workable things that the developer could do building upon what's already on the site plan to address those concerns. What, what's the width of that green, of the green line there that's right next to the road? Uh, that is in a hundred foot buffer, the one next to the road. And that's, that's a, a requirement because this is a planned residential development. That's called the, uh, the thoroughfare open space. Gotcha. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. All righty. Um, the second item that's going to uh, be uh, have a public hearing at the August 4th meeting is an item to consider the submission of an application to the North Carolina Department of Commerce Rural Economic Development Division to apply for and accept, if awarded, a rural building reuse grant to support the expansion of Frank L. Bloom Construction Company's office headquarters in Forsyth County. You've got an associated resolution uh, with the submission of the application to the North Carolina Department of Commerce Rural Economic Development Commission. And I don't know if, uh, Hassani, if you, I don't know if you presented to this board yet or not. This is Hassani Mitchell. Uh, Hassani um, filled the position after um, Kyle Haney was um, promoted into that, uh, into Dan Cornell's old role. And so you've got the new Kyle Haney here and Hassani's just jumped on board and done great work. And we appreciate you, Hot. He's the new, t the new Kyle Haney. Well, he'll be the he's he's the Hassani Mitchell now, so he's uh, he's the guy, and Good. so he's, he's working Good. with the um, he's really taking the economic development. How piece. do you pronounce that first name? It's Hassani. Hassan. Hassani. Yes, sir. Hassani. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, certainly a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to be here all today. I got a presentation. <laughs> I think I saw it. <laughs> Is it down? Okay. She's the boss. <laughs> yeah. You're from Winston Salem? 
I am. I'm a Winston-Salem native, proud alumni, double alumni of Winston-Salem State University. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, are, you, are, you just rung the bell. Yeah. So you play football, basketball, or both? Uh, I played. I played a little football in high school. Uh, went to Glen High School, defensive yeah. end. Here, here, here! Bobcats <laughs> all the way. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have to say anything else. You've already won an audience. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I see. I see the orange. I mean, we're to be honest with you. I'm a Ram too. So, so absolutely, absolutely. Kindred spirits. Kindred spirits. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, certainly a pleasure to be before you today. Item that I'm going to be covering is the building reuse grant to support the expansion of uh, the expansion and the renovation of Frank L. Bloom Construction's uh, new co new corporate headquarters. Uh, just to give you some background information before we get into the presentation, uh, the North Carolina Department of Commerce, they administer the building reuse grants, and that is funneled through uh, local government in the form of a forgivable loan to the company. Uh, hence, for Scythe County, we are that municipality that handles the building reuse grants. Uh, so unlike a normal incentive where the county is actually putting in funds, uh, this is in the form of a forgivable loan and we pass that through uh, to the company. So I wanted to give you some background information there. So company details, I believe everybody has a level of familiarity with Frank L. Bloom Construction. Uh, they are a local uh, general contractor here in Winston-Salem and they provide construction management, uh, design build services, and general contracting for a myriad of uh, organizations, higher education, healthcare, K through 12 schools, uh, commercial structures, and other industries. As I indicated, they're based here in Winston-Salem. Uh, they've been here for quite some time, uh, well over 100 years, uh, but they do have satellite operations in Greensboro, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Asheville. Uh, but it is important to note that their company headquarters is here in Winston-Salem, but they're located statewide. Frank L. Bloom Construction, they currently employ 218 part-time and full-time employees. And so as a part of their expansion, um, they are looking to relocate their company headquarters, which is currently located on East 25th Street. And they purchased uh, a facility, 2601 Pilgrim Court. This is the former uh, Enmar campus. It's been vacant for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And so Frank L. Bloom Construction will locate uh, their company headquarters from East 25th Street to the location on Pilgrim Court. I do wanna note, uh, they, they, they will still maintain that property on East 25th Street. Uh, they will house equipment there, and they will also have uh, some self-performing divisions that are still located at that division. Um, so it's still gonna be active, but all corporate um, operations will take place at the Pilgrim Court location. Is this the property off of Coliseum? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. It's been vacant a long time. Uh, it's been vacant for quite a long time, I believe since 2014, so it's good to see some activity at that location. As a part of the expansion and the renovation, Frank L. Bloom Construction is looking to make a $3.4 million capital investment, and that's in real property as well as personal property. And a part of the, the expansion and renovation, uh, they look to create up to 35 new uh, full-time jobs. And those jobs, uh, if you're curious, those jobs include account managers, uh, field engineers, project managers, superintendents, um, their HR division as well will all be housed at this new location. So to talk about the incentives, as I stated earlier, this is a building reuse grant. State of North Carolina has proposed up to $350,000 for the expansion and renovation of this project. Um, as I stated earlier, the applicant must be a local government entity, which is us, and we pass those funds through to the company in the form of a forgivable loan. Um, we're responsible for repayment if the terms aren't met, uh, but we do have provisions and a promissory note to guarantee those funds at the end of the project. And I'm happy to take any questions. Oh. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Sonny. You did a great job. Yes, very thank good. you very much. All right, so the only Wait thing- Committed Captain wants to know if there's a cafeteria for him. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 All righty. I'm just going to briefly uh, describe a few of the items we're working on that will be presented to you formally at the second briefing in two weeks. 
Um, and so we're, um, the board had had some discussions around a naming policy for Forsyth County facilities. And so Damon's uh, working to get those recommendations to you based on the comments that he heard. Um, we do have some budget and finance matters, one around the motor vehicle and uh, mobile equipment replacement uh, capital projects ordinance. Those are actually some more vehicles that have been wrecked. And so we, we're trying to, trying to get the insurance settlement work done on that. Um, uh, the, there's an item with state uh, criminal alien assistance program or SCAP grant funds that we will present to you then. Uh, we have a number of contracts. One of them is a revised um, budget contract with Health and Human Services over that behavioral health funding that was uh, significant in last year's uh, General Assembly, the $12.5 million. And so we have outlined how we're going to spend that and what we're going to do that with. And so we'll present that to you. Uh, we have a, an agreement with Twin City Harm Reduction uh, for services around the um, harm reduction efforts for opioid and other, other substances. Um, with the SRO contract will be in front of you. Uh, we do have uh, an agreement with a, an artist uh, to do an art sculpture at the Clemens Branch Library. Uh, I am pleased to say that that is, uh, and, and Damon can go into detail about it next Thursday or when it's we... It's not. It's not dandelions. It is not dandelions. And, um, and, and $955,000 <laughs> less. And, and it's all donated funds. So uh, this is honoring the, the donations that we were made to us. So we'll... Thank you. We'll take care of that. You've got four of these items um, Gary Koontz is going to go into detail with around um, hosting, maintenance, uh, software, um, a project for infrastructure at Tanglewood Park that sort of ties into the Tanglewood Park project um, for uh, fiber optics, and then really some security things that were part of this last year's budget uh, where we're trying to shore up and make sure that the security on our network system is in good shape. Uh, we have two, two items that relate to, one, one relates to printing services that's absolutely essential for tax administration to get tax bills out, and then also for the Board of Elections to print ballots. And so we've had a little hiccup on a contract there that we're, we're trying to uh, address, and so you'll hear about that. Um, and then we've um, got the uh, temporary employment services for uh, one-stop voting for Board of Elections. A few reports, and that's it. So it's pretty straightforward agenda. There's right much business to do at that meeting on that agenda, but it's all pretty straightforward. We'll get, in, pre in preparation get for the SRO grant, mm -hmm. the, the, I think a real issue is what the, uh, the state has just allocated a fair amount of money for both for school safety, including SROs. And my, my memory may be wrong, but I think it includes... Uh, like resource officer in every middle school. If that's the case, I mean, I, I, the amount of money didn't look enough to do that, but but basically it could be, and and that would that would actually change our I, it should change the contract ultimately with what the state may be doing. Yeah, I, I guess we. Just I wonder if we're recipients of that money or the schools. Um, I, and well, I'm not sure. Yeah, to be honest with you, it may be the schools, I and that would would the reduce school. the need for the contract the the part that we would contract with then. The local I'll, side. I will. We'll make sure we get out in front of that. Yep. Very good. Thank you for mentioning that. And then the only other item I had is we. Um, Gord, do you want to mention the uh, printout that they've got in front of them on the on how we fared in the 2022 budget? And Dudley, before you go there, I have a question that's unrelated. Um, what what are we doing um, with our MIS systems here? For example, are, is there any upgrades coming since you're here? Could you talk to that, or is there a need? And I'm asking because um, I watched one of our meetings online, and it just had this scrambly kind of thing going on. I don't know exactly what it was, but huh. I don't know. Do we need upgrades? Do we need to yeah. look at our systems? This system actually was upgraded just a couple of years. Time gets away from me, but two or three years ago, we upgraded the that. That might have just been a hiccup. Um, uh, do you know, Gary? This happened about two weeks ago. Um, I have to. If you can give me the meeting date, I'll be glad to go review the okay. video. Um, sure. But overall, it's, it, they've they've been playing fairly well. There's there's no planned upgrades. From uh, a broadcasting standpoint, uh, we did, uh, with the, when you went to the new agenda system, we did get a new piece of equipment for that, awesome. which now streams out, streams things out a different way. But if you can get me the information on that meeting, I'll be glad to review that. Sure, video. I'll do like that. Like Dudley Thank said, you. it's probably just, hopefully just a glitch at that point in time. I, I don't have any planned upgrades for broadcasting equipment. That okay. Yeah. Maybe next budget year, depending on what the communications and marketing department and all that goes. But. It's pretty new. Yeah, yeah, well, this is pretty, pretty new, so.
All right. the old, I'll, the I'll look at it and life. then I'll tell you about I'll get back to you but I saw that and I was just was just disappointed we, we do have a lot of refreshes planned but nothing's particularly centered around broadcasting okay fair enough thank you All right. I'll just quickly go through uh, the document that the managers handed you this was prepared by Blair in representative Lambus office and I would just say to ignore the um, fiscal year information, all of this money was actually for fiscal year 2023, with the exception of the 5.7 million from Winston-Salem State. The first line item is just the um, standard funding that Winston-Salem State gets every year, the 65 million. So that's not really anything new. The second item is, is the 2.4 million we've discussed that will be for the Tanglewood Business Park um, water and sewer infrastructure. As you know, we've funded the lift station there and a road is being constructed to access this. This will allow us to, to get the uh, site more ready for, for a business. Uh, we're, we're moving toward getting a, a shovel ready site. So in case you know a wonderful project comes down the pike, we'll be able to accommodate that. Um, there, there are a couple other things that other folks in the community received. Uh, the court system got a new assistant clerk and a, um, a judicial, um, the district court has a district court coordinator. Um, some towns got some money. And then there was a $700,000 um, entry for Forsyth County, which just says local government project. And so that was not tied to any specific project. Uh, we did not ask for $700,000. All the projects we asked for were $3 million or more. But um, anyhow, um, I'm sure the manager would appreciate if, if any of you have ideas that that $700,000 could be used for. Um, we we um, Ashley Perkinson, our lobbyist, has asked around, and so far it, it apparently hasn't been tied to any specific project. It just says local government project. And some other communities also received money. Um, Kernersville and Clemens um, also received money. And you can see the list here. Um, I'm, I, I don't really know too much about the items other than the two Forsyth County amounts, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. What's the difference between a budget, the budget committee report and the budget bill? There are different ways of dispersing money. And so um, the one I'm more familiar with is um, House Bill 103, which is the top amounts. And that's where the county received its money. But also what they'll do is they'll create funds and then those funds sometimes get distributed through a, a budget committee report. But um, it has a page number in the budget. So it's obviously in the budget, I guess. I guess. I mean, it has a, it has a page can be found. number, but the page number is from the budget committee report. The uh, above is the page number for, you know, on the top is the page number for the House budget, the House bill. One item, that, one item that's not on the list that um, I understand was there is, is um, uh, ARCA uh, had actually received a they received, they received $2 million. Yeah. So, and that so will that, be on our enough. project at Springwood, I believe. So so they should be significantly funded for that Springwood project now. Yeah. And and I see that Kernersville Folly, even though we funded them, how does it, that's a one-time event, correct? Is that a one-time event? That's a facility. This, this is all one-time money? No, 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 no. Yeah, but it, I'm asking a specific building. one. The Kernersville Folly, yep. as far as the building. No, no, Kernersville Folly is a building. A building. Oh, well, not the not the Kernersville Folly event. Right, correct. It's, it's a building. building. It's okay, building. fair enough. That's fine. Yeah. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Oh. All right, then. <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> I just wanted I to make sure follow. that there wasn't a duplication of services. Uh, that's all. I have one follow-up question, Gordon. Yes, sir. On the uh, two hundred fifty thousand allocation. For Forsyth to jail and prison ministries, is that a regular allocation, just one-time allocation, or the, what do you my, what do you know about that? My under, I don't know much, but my understanding is these are all non-recurring or one-time um, grants, and so that that is a, a a private group. That's a considerable amount of money. I'm not sure what they were asking for. That's what the senior put it. Exactly put it in. Where? 
I thought the ministers did this voluntarily, though. I'll, I'll make other inquiries and other sources. Well, curious minds wants to know, you know. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Commissioner Kaplan. If any of you do have legislative goals or legislative issues or recommendations or bills you'd like to see, e even though it seems like 2023 is a long time away, um, the NCACC is already collecting legislative goals. So, so either let Dudley or me know, and, and we'll be happy to work on that. Are we finished with that? I, I just have one concern I'd like for us to think about. Um, it seems as though every time we advertise for appointments to seek volunteers to serve on our boards and commissions, it gets smaller and smaller each time. Um, I honestly do not think that we show these folks enough appreciation. Some of those boards are very time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, and it was pre-COVID, so I can't remember how long ago, but we used to have, um, I think it was around Christmas time, we would have a reception for all of our commission members. And they really did appreciate it. It was a time for them to come in and we could personally say thank you. Um, have a little light refreshments, nothing major. But at least we showed them that we, we were appreciative of their time. We don't do anything for these folks now. Um, don't even invite me to give them a Write a letter and say, you know, thank you for applying. But I just think we need to spend more time um, coming up with a way to show these folks we appreciate their time because these boards are very important. Good idea, county. yeah. And just, I would like for us to think about that. We had a luncheon one year. I remember it. We've had all sorts of yeah. things. Um, I, we'd have to go back. It, 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 mm -hmm. It's a long history. I can't yeah. remember all of it. You remember it. Uh, we used to do more for them than what we do yeah. now. Well, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. Let's thank them at Thanksgiving for a nice <laughs> luncheon. We can start, we start working on it. We'll, we'll do a little research and see what we've done in the past and get that back to you in a discussion. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little, it is strange because, you know, there are so many things that we used to do that when COVID hit, we just stopped. And so getting some of those started back has proven to be, I mean, of course, COVID has been difficult and when you, when you responsibly do that. But um, with the retirees launching on. That's right. We didn't do that. That's right. You hadn't done that for almost three years. Now, so. <laughs> All done. Good. Commissioner Kaplan has moved. We adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. All right. uh, <laughs>